I was steaming. I'm, I worked how long to build this stupid thing for you? So I have to go in through the gate that I got wired shut because they can get through anything. So I'm going to unwire it, get in there, and set this manger back up, and I'm, I'm steaming. And during this time, I take a piece of the fence that has been broken off for a while and throw it back over the fence so I can fix it. And I, I'm, I'm mad, and he's still trying to buck that thing, and I got a stick, and I'm smacking it. And uh, he, uh, <clears throat> I pick up this tool because I'm going to pound in this T post because it's not deep enough. And I swing, and I miss, and I hit my knee. <laughs> At that time, I thought about Phil Lamers. <laughs> I bought that thing from Phil Lamers. <laughs> I think it's defective, and I'm going to talk to him about a warranty on it. <laughs> but the thing I learned is, don't be angry. You, you, if you're angry, you're just going to make mistake after mistake after mistake. Cooled down, my leg was still swollen, put the hay in there, and I thought, thank you, Lord, it's all done. Came out this morning and the goats are on top of it, <laughs> eating the apple tree. <laughs> I had to move it because they were just that close to getting into each other's pen, and then we would have goats we don't when we don't want them. Uh, January is not a good month to be birthed. I'll tell you that. So God is good. My knee hurts, and Phil, I'll be talking to you later. <laughs> If you turn to your, in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13, I like, uh, as Whitney says, I, I like to find, I find <coughs> little things in the Bible, and, I, and before you know it, I've been down this rabbit hole into a uh, mole hole, into, and I just go all the way with it. And I, I just enjoy little things like that. And I know John's going through the book of Hebrews, and there's always been discussion, well, who wrote Hebrews? Well, we all know that God wrote Hebrews, Hebrews but... What was the, the, the man that he wrote it through, you know? And some people believe Paul. I personally believe it was Apollos. I, I, I find that very interesting. And if you want to talk about it sometime, come ask me and I'll explain to you because I don't have time now. But I, I, I love this book. This is a fantastic book. And if we look at Hebrews chapter 13, there's a, there's a verse in here that just kind of comes out of nowhere. And, and, and it makes me think. Verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember that they, uh, <clears throat> remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, and being yourselves also in the body. <clears throat> Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Poor mongers and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For ye hath said, for he has said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. I look at that and I look at verse 8. And that's kind of a verse kind of out of place. It just seems like we just stuck that verse in there. I do think it applies to the next verse, is, which is uh, don't be carried away with strange doctrines and, and diverse doctrines. But we have Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. <clears throat> we have, <clears throat> what does this mean? What, is, what, do, what do we mean by Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? I think first we have to figure out who is Jesus Christ. My dad and I were talking the other day, actually I guess it was yesterday, and we were talking about the Jews. What was the hang up with the Jews with Jesus? They were looking for the Messiah. They had been taught from whatever, however age they were that the Messiah was going to come and the Messiah was going to reign. And so I remember I talked about Jesus coming into uh, 
uh, Jerusalem during the Passover, and he comes in the triumphal entry, and people are praising him because they think he's coming to rule. He's going to kick Rome out. So here is Messiah. Messiah King is coming. Something that they didn't know and something even today that stops many Jews from believing in Jesus. If you turn over to John 8. John 8, 55, just for context here. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him, and if I should say I know him, not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. That's a unique statement, isn't it? What is the... The words that God used to describe himself in the Old Testament. I am. Who should I say, Ray Moses said, the burning bush, who should I say sent me? I am that I am. In your King James Bible, in your New King James Bible, if you're reading through the Old Testament, you see the word Lord. And that word Lord is all capital letters. That means I am. It can be translated Jehovah. Or Yahweh. But it is I am. It's recorded over 6,800 times in the Old Testament. It says in verse 59, they took up stones to cast at him. And Jesus hid himself. You know why they picked up a stone to cast at him? He claimed to be I am. He claimed to be God. They weren't expecting the Messiah to be God. They thought the Messiah was going to be a prophet. Or the prophet. Or, or something else. A great leader. A king. Like Saul. Like David. They didn't expect him to be God. In John 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Here we have a picture of Jesus, pictured as the Word. And here it says the Word was God. It says that Jesus created all things, and all things were created for him. In verse 14 it says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I always uh, joke about, I wish that I could have been a fly on the lapel of one of those guys from the Damascus Road. I'd like to have heard everything that Jesus expanded from the scripture about himself because I know that I have missed a library full of examples. I, I think I know things, and then every time I go to FBI class, even though it's just about the same class, I learn something new every time. If I can listen to somebody speak and I say, you know, I've heard that before. And then by the end of the class, like, wow, I didn't ever think of it that way. I constantly learn stuff. Just to hear Jesus talk about himself from the Old Testament would have been phenomenal. Here we have a clear picture that Jesus is pointing to himself as God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is saying, I, God, am the same. So I started thinking of that. Well, what does this mean? You know, I see a lot of things happen in the Old Testament that don't happen in the New Testament. We looked at Sodom and Gomorrah as being destroyed. We see God commanding the Israelites to kill every person, including women and children. I don't see that in the New Testament. What's going on? How can he be the same? I thought, you know, that's, that would be a fantastic study. And I said, well, I'll do this. It'll take 10 minutes. I start writing down, and before you know it, I'm, I can't even get off ground level. It's going to take me a week of, a week of Sundays just to start this. But I'm going to attempt to start this. I wanted to ask those questions. Is the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the same God? And is he dealing with things the same way? <coughs> if you turn to Colossians chapter 1, 
And we're going to look just real quick at this. And I think in order for us to answer this question, we have to know who God is. We have to have an idea of who and what God is. Chapter 1, and we're going to go to verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, through the Son's blood, even the forgiveness of sins? Who is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him are all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's a pretty big picture of God, isn't it? It's kind of humbling to be driving down the road, and it dawns on you that God just stops everything and we just disappear. It's all gone. God has that control. When it says all things consist, that means he holds everything up and he makes everything follow the courses that they follow. My next breath is not dependent on my diaphragm and my body to take. By the grace of God, I take my next breath. It's a humbling thought, isn't it? An all-powerful, all Knowing being is in control of that. It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? You know, we've got uh, animals, so we have these things called flies. <laughs> and they're terrible. So we, we put up little uh, strips to catch flies, and, and I'm kind of sadistic. <laughs> and the little flies are stuck on the strips, and I come over like I'm going to smack them, and they, and they try to get them up. <laughs> think about my relationship to God. I'm just a little fly. I'm just a little ant in comparison to this almighty creature. When I was a kid, I was pretty mean. I used to pour water down the ant hills. I used to, to use the magnifying glass, put salt around the slug. That's pretty sobering to think that somebody would have that power over all of us. I think we have to look at who God is and what his nature is and what his attributes are and why he doesn't do that to us and why we can have faith and trust that he is wise and he knows what he's doing. Spirit says in this verse that he is invisible. He's the invisible God. He has no form. He has no confines. One of the things that I, I really liked, there's a guy named uh, Lou Giglio, I believe is his name, and he did this fantastic study where he goes through and he looks at the heavens, and he looks at the immenseness of the galaxy, of the universe. And one of my favorite psalms is Psalms chapter 6. It says that he made the, the stars and the heavens with his fingers. That's a big God, isn't it? You look at how big our universe is. They, they calculate it's 13 billion light years wide. Now remember, that's a measurement and not an estimation of time. That's how wide it is, how big it is. And God did that with his fingers. And I look at what Lou Giglio brought, and he brings these suns. He says, oh, here's our sun, and our earth will fit 20 times inside this sun. How big is your God? How big did the God have to be to make that? Well, guess what? There's another star that takes our sun and puts a hundred of those in. And guess what? There's another star that will take a thousand of those. It's immense. Amen. We have no comprehension of how big God is. And I find that people, including myself, so I'm talking to me as much as anybody else, I have God in my pocket. And something comes up and I say, oh, God, I need help. That's not a very good thought of how God is. is God is not in my pocket. God is a person. He's not an idea. He's not somebody's imaginary development. He's an actual person. 
He's not some energy somebody made up so they can feel good about themselves or they can, they can divert blame to something else. Oh, well, God doesn't like me and that's why. Destroyed all my crops. We're made in his image. God is a person. God has emotion. God has care. One of the things that uh, I really find fascinating is, and, and I, I talk about this all the time, is I think God has a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I really do. I, I, you know, we, you read through the scripture, and I don't know that I can, I can find a place where Jesus was laughing and joking with his disciples, but I think he has a sense of humor. I think about the, the plagues in Egypt. Remember, there was ten plagues in Egypt. Did you know that each one of those plagues was designed against a god of Egypt? He took whatever that God represented and used that plague to punish them and showed him them that that God was not in control of it. He was. One of my favorite ones is in 1 Samuel 5. And if you don't know the story, I'll give you a little bit of background real quick and you don't have to turn there. But. So the children of Israel were using the Ark of the Covenant like a good luck charm, and what they would do is they would take this cub, this ark with them, and they would put it out in front of themselves, even though God wasn't condoning what they were doing, and they would use this ark as a good luck charm in battle. Well, they lost. And the Philistines took the ark, and they, they beat the Israelites, took the ark, and they put it into the, their temple. And when, Ash, when they of Ash, I wrote a scene. When the Philistines took the ark, they brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now remember, Dagon is a fish god. And he, has, he looks like a fish. It's, it's pretty neat. You know, uh, ask me about it and I'll show you some stuff. But, and when they of Ashad rose early tomorrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face on the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him up in place again. Find that interesting. They came in and what's wrong? Their God is laying face down, prone in front of the Lord God. In front of the Ark of the Covenant. They had to pick him up because he couldn't pick himself up. And set him back up. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face in the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. I think God has a sense of humor. He says, you didn't get it the first time, did you? This might have been an accident. This time you're going to fall over and I'm going to break your, your God into pieces. It's kind of interesting I was going to do it. A little study on thresholds, but there's a lot about thresholds that stem from this. Don't step on the threshold. Step across the threshold because Dagon was broken across that threshold. Carry your bride across the threshold unless she trips and falls. <laughs> Interesting, huh? <clears throat> we see that God is a trinity. God is one God. But he's also three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one of them is 100% God, but all three are individuals, but yet they're one God. And you say, Dave, how do you even explain that? I have no idea. <laughs> I have heard people give illustration after illustration, and, and you come to the point where you're just barely scratching the surface of what it is, but you're still miles away. And I think that you can... Apply things to God that don't really represent God. And you have to be careful. You know, they talk about blasphemy and don't use the Lord's name in vain. Whenever you ascribe something to God that's not him, that's a problem. Each one is equal and eternal. Those are some given things, and that's not all of them, because I don't have time to go through all of them. If I went through all of them, we would spend... Two or three Sundays just on the nature of God. But I want to talk about some of his attributes now. And I'm going to list a non-exhaustive list of them. And we're only going to talk about a few of them. 
And this is before we can even talk about how he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We've got to know about God. We have to know what is in his heart toward us. Attributes would be he's holy, he's just and righteous, self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal, infinite, omnipresent, omniscient, omnip uh, omnip omnipotent, omniscient, mm -hmm. Wise, immutable, free, sovereign, incomprehensible. I like that one. That's, that's a unique one. I didn't cover it in here, but if your God can be comprehended, that's a pretty small God. Mm -hmm. When you find all these other gods that we, <clears throat> last time I spoke, we talked about Nimrod and Samarimus. And when your God is defined by human thought, it's only human. You look at Jupiter, and you look at all the problems they had. They had all earthly, manly problems. Inscrutable, true, faithful, light, merciful, good, gracious, and love, just to say a few. There's, there's more and more that you could add to this, and it would take a year to even begin to cover this. But I think the most important one would be his holiness. That's a pretty big thing. What exactly is holiness? Some people would tell you that <clears throat> holiness is good, being good, being goodness in itself. Holiness is not that. Holiness is separate, apart from. God is absolutely separate from and exalted above his creation. He's, he's not even close to us. We're not even close to him. We're not even just vaguely in the image of him. He is equally separate from all moral evil and sin. It's completely opposite of him. He is completely set apart. He has absoluteness and majesty. He is deserving of worship. He is supreme and unequaled. We have no way to compare him. We have no idea how to really describe him, except for what's given to us in the scripture. I can't even wrap my head around this to think that he is holy, way above me. I can't even fathom this, let alone understand this. You know what? He's not one of us. There was a song that came out in the, in the nine, maybe it was a nine, I'm sort of date myself, and the, the girl saying, what if God was one of us? God is not one of us. He is so far transcended above us. Man's whole desire is to bring God down to himself or to bring himself up to God. And that's where we see all of these other religions. They're trying to work themselves into godhood. I think of the, the Mormons and how they believe. If you do the right thing, you yourself can become a god and have your own planet. God is not one of us. God could, I could not make myself. I could not make another human being. I do not have that power. We are created in his image, but we are not on the same level. There's a completely different set of rules. <clears throat> he is outside of time and space. He's not governed by time. In fact, time is inside of him. He's the one that made time and space. We look at Genesis and we, we read through there and we can see where God instituted time and space. By the way, there's another verse in Genesis that I absolutely love. Genesis 1.16. And it says, I made the sun and the moon, and all this stuff, and he says, oh, he also made the stars. Isn't that neat how the Bible just has little tiny things like that here and there, and they actually mean enormous things? I think what's even more interesting is, if you're saved today, you are already seated in glory with God. God's already with you in glory. That's kind of hard to think about, isn't it? We are already there. The 
kind of talked a little bit about that this morning with Philippians. We're not there yet, you and I. We're governed by time. But God is in every time at the same time. And that's why he could say, before Abraham, I am. Amen. He is separate from everything that is sinful. Sin is anything outside of the nature of God. Anything that's opposite of God is sin. Wilmington's Guide, and if you ever go into the FBI class, we do use Wilmington's Guide, and I do enjoy it. It's, it's a pretty good help me book. This is what Wilmington said. Without a doubt, the most prominent attribute of God, as presented by both the Old Testament and New Testament, is his holiness. One single perfection would perhaps come closer to this one single perfection would come closer to describing the eternal creator than any other characteristic he possesses. This is, this is fantastic. It has been suggested that his holiness is a union of all other attributes as pure white light is a union of all the colors of the spectrum. I look at these lights and I just see clear white light. But if you take and hold up a prism to them, what can you do? You can divide all these lights, and what do you see? All different colors of the rainbow, don't you? All the different colors out there are in this one light. So is God's holiness. Everything comes into his holiness. Tozer said, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is the standard. He is, absolute, he is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being anything other than it is. Because of his holy, all his attributes are holy. God is holy and he has made holiness the moral condition necessary for the health of his universe. Everything that's defined by God is holy. Everything that's not of God is not holy. Whenever it is contrary to the, <clears throat> whenever, whatever is contrary to this is necessarily under his eternal displeasure. To preserve his creation, God must destroy whatever would destroy it. Kind of gives you a picture of what God sees. How does he see sin and rebellion? It has to be punished. Another thing that I looked at in, in the holiness, and then I had to look up how to pronounce this. You know how I am with, with speaking. I'm tongue-tied a lot of the time. Trihagion is holy, 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 put together in three places, three words, right back to back to back. Isaiah 6, 3 and Re Revelation 4, 8 are the places that you find that. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now, the Jews, whenever they wanted to emphasize something and they wanted you to pay attention to it, it was repeated three times in a row. So, here we are. Holy, holy, holy. It's an important thing. God's holiness is important. But I also see this as holy, holy, holy. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all three holy in and of themselves, even though they're one God. Whew. That's incomprehensible, isn't it? It's hard to understand. When the angels around the throne call or cry one to another, holy, 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 they're expressing with force and passion the true of the supreme holiness of God that is essential characteristic which expresses his awesomeness and majestic nature. The trihagion <clears throat> expresses the triune nature of God, the three persons of the Godhead, equal in holiness and majesty. God is just and righteous. God's righteousness or justice is his perfect moral nature of always perfectly dealing rightly and justly with all that is holy and unholy. Did you catch that? Holy and unholy. Here we're going back to his holiness again. Of justly punishing all evil and rewarding all good. 
These both come from the same word, righteousness and justice, in the original language, but you can actually make a distinguish, and you can see the two different words. Righteousness, in righteousness, God reveals his love for holiness. In justice, God reveals his hatred for sin. You know, <clears throat> people will say, well, you know, I just told a fib or a white lie. I just did a, a, a little thing. In God's eyes, that's not a little thing. That is just as horrific as any other sin. Now, there are certain sins that he called them an abomination, and I believe that they, those people will be dealt more harshly in the end. But just for a white lie, Jesus still would have had to die. Just for one little thing, I still would have had to nail Jesus to the cross. Sin is a big deal. Even a little sin is a big deal. God is eternal. He was never created. And that's hard. That's really hard to think about. You know, I can, I can almost think about eternity past. Almost. But I can't. Really. Everything that I know, everything that I've been a part of, I see a beginning and end. Even, I used to have a 55 Chevy. And since my, given it to my brother and gave him that, I mean, that wonderful thing. <laughs> and he's actually building it up and runs now and he drives it down the street. And, but it's still far from being done. A long ways from being done. You know, that car existed here before I did. But there's a born on date on it. I can look and see when it was made. I can talk to my dad and my dad... <clears throat> It was before 1955. So he could tell me for sure that car had a beginning. But everything we know of, even trees, as old as they can get, they all had a beginning. And it's hard for us to understand something that does not have a beginning. It's just incomprehensible. God will never die. There, there is no end. There is a future eternity. It's like, how? Look at things on this earth, and I don't know if I want to be a future eternity. <laughs> Praise the Lord, we'll be going to heaven. We'll be going into a unincorruptible body. We'll be changed in a moment. We talked about this earlier today. We will be perfect. It will be completely different. And no, I don't think we'll be on the clouds drumming and <laughs> doing all sorts. I think we have a lot of stuff to do. I think we'll be busy people, and we will absolutely love eternity. And I used to think about that and think, well, you know, how could God even know what I really want to do? Because everything I want to do is not close to what he wants me to do. But I think that when we do what we were created for, we will find joy and pleasure in that. He is outside time and space. He is eternal. He had to be something outside of time and space had to create time and space. God is eternal. God is light. This is, this is fascinating. When you look at creation, it said God created light. Guess we created on day four? The sun, the moon, the stars. So there was light before the sun and the moon and the stars. It says in, I believe it is Psalms 106, that God wears light like a puts it on and he walks around in light. God is light. He is self-revealing with information about himself. Everything we know about God is right here. <coughs> he has given us a window of who he is in this book. He is both the source and strength of all illumination. Can you see all illumination? Yeah, I mean the sun and stars and the moon and all that stuff. But I also mean of morality, mental, spiritual rays of information and inspiration come from God. God is love. Now, my dad told me something once, and I'll, I'll probably say this, and he'll say, oh, you always remember the things I don't want you to remember. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that he said to me, and I, comfort, I think about this a lot. You know, God is love, but love is not God. Think about that for a little bit. God is love.
But love is not God. God's love is unconditional. You think about the evil that we have done. You think about the evils that Abraham did, that Adam did, that Adam and Eve both did, and the love God had. God made a, a, a commitment to Israel, and he walked himself through that agreement. He took it all upon himself. When he sent his son to die on the cross, it was unconditional love. We read some verses in the worship meeting this morning. While we were yet sinners, while we were still enemies of God, he died for us. He planned this before I was ever made, before I was ever born. Unconditional love. It was an intentional love. He knew exactly what was going to happen, didn't he? He knew if he went to the cross what was going to happen, what he was going to have to endure. I think about Jesus when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's, he's weeping and sweating great drops of blood. Do you think it was because they were going to put him on a cross and rip his beard out and beat his back? That's what I'd have been crying about. Something much worse he endured on the cross than that. It's perfect love. It's a love without any strings. It's a gift. We talked about that one too. It's the gift of God. It's nothing earned. He wants to share his love with all men. Come to, come to him today. He forgives all. He's a very forgiving and loving God. I always think back to Jonah. Jonah, remember, he was sent to talk to the Ninevites and to have them repent. And Jonah says, no, I don't want to go because you're a forgiving God. I, I don't want them to repent. I want them to be punished. God is a forgiving God. He is infinite. God has no limitations out of, outside of his own nature. And limitless. How can a limited mind comprehend, in, comprehend unlimited unlimitedness being able to do anything you say well can can God can God do anything well actually he can't there's some things he can't do he can't sin he can't go against himself he can't lie he can't tell you a lie isn't it good to know that God has limitation to that that what he tells you is truth. I don't have to sit here and go, I hope God lets me take my next breath. I hope the sun comes up tomorrow. It says in the Bible that he's ordained the sun to come up tomorrow. It's always going to come up tomorrow. Measureless. Tozer says, measurement describes limitations, imperfections, and cannot apply to God. We cannot speak of measure amount, size, or weight at the same time as speaking to God. There's no way we can put those in the same sentence. He is all-powerful. His love is infinite. His grace is infinite. His power is infinite. God is affinity. When I was, when I was a kid, we used to always try to one-up each other. And we would say, oh, I triple dog dare you, or whatever we were using at that time. And it would, it would progress, and finally you would say, Times infinity. Oh yeah, affinity times two. <laughs> you can't really do that, can you? It's, it's already infinity. You, affinity times affinity is still infinity. I guess it's one times one. God is infinite. He is infinity. There's nothing you can add to make him more than what he already is. He's already there. <clears throat> Finally, to one I wanted to talk about. Immutability. What does immutable mean? Immutable, unchanging over time, unable to be changed, or susceptible to change. That's pretty complex, isn't it? There is nothing that will change your mind, nothing that can make you even think about changing your mind. God cannot change his essence, character, attributes, and purpose. In Malachi 3, 6, it says, in part 1, it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. 
there's, there's nothing that will change with God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's nothing I can do to change the way he sees this. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. There's that lights again and the Father being light. With whom is no variableness. There is no gray area. God has a right and a wrong and that's where we operate. That's where he operates it. Neither shadow of turning. That's a very interesting thing to say. That means he doesn't even consider turning. There is nothing that brings up in his mind that he's going to say, well, you know, maybe I was wrong. I'm going to do it this way now. And in order to start the study of is the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament the same, we have to look at a few of those things throughout the character and essence of God. We have to define what is God? What is his power? What is he about? We find that he's holy. He has to be holy. There's holy and unholy. There's, there's good and there's evil. He's the opposite. He's infinite. Every one of his attributes is infinite also. His power is infinite. His love is infinite. He's immutable. He doesn't change. What he tells you he's going to do, he is going to do. There is nothing you can do to change that. Because God is holy, all good must be rewarded. Because God is holy, all sin must be punished. Amen. All sin. Dave, what about, what if Hitler, before he died, professed salvation? Would he be saved too? Would, would God forgive all of his son, sin? You bet he would have. If Hitler was true, truly repentant and followed Christ, you bet he would be saved. But Dave, all those bad things he did. Somebody died on a cross for every one of those bad things. Hitler wasn't, isn't going to escape that <clears throat> the sin that Hitler committed is not going to escape punishment. It was paid for. No matter what sin you've done, God paid for it on the cross. The comfort that I get is when I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that sin is imputed from me onto him. And I get something in return. I get Jesus' Righteousness Amen. imputed onto me. God looks at me as if he's looking at the Son. That I never committed a sin. Jesus took all of that on the cross. There's nothing you could have done that God cannot forgive. God died for every sin. It's up to you to repent and come to him. Ask for forgiveness. God sent his only begotten son down to this earth. We looked at that in John 1. Verse behind me here, Isaiah 9, 6. If the Jews just would have read that verse, they would have seen that a child is born, a son is given, and his name shall be Almighty God. He was called the, the Father here. He was called the Almighty God, the Prince of Peace. Wonderful. All those things about Jesus Christ. Jesus came here and died on the cross for your sin. No matter what you've done, you can come to him. He will forgive you. Not only did he die, but he rose again so that you can spend eternity with him. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Father, thank you for this morning that we can come together and look at your scripture and, and learn about you and study about you and see all your wonderful nature and attributes and know that you are in control of everything. And that I don't have to worry about that. That you, you are doing good things, holy things, and everything for your good pleasure. Lord, please help us as we go out through the week that we'd be salt and light in the earth. That we would be witnesses for you and pronounce your holy and loving name. I pray these things in Jesus' name.